Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you once again for the opportunity that you've given us to continue on with this study in Romans, verse by verse. We're just grateful for the opportunity you've given us just to fellowship around your word together and in this format, and I just ask that you would strip away all foolishness but just seal to our hearts that which is truth for it's in christ's name i pray amen we've been studying together in the epistle to the romans verse by verse and in our last study together we were just beginning to look at chapter seven we haven't really gotten far along into it at all. I think I just gave an introduction in, in a previous video. The seventh chapter begins with the illustration from the law that a woman was bound to her husband as long as he lived. Many people just take this as instructions on marriage and when in fact it's much deeper than that. And that in fact if she was married to another man while she was married to this husband then she uh, would be called an adulteress. So I want to talk to you about spiritual adultery. The fact is that if the husband died, she's free to be married to another man and would not be called an adulteress. That's the illustration that we're being given. The illustration is that we were married to the law. We died to the law. The law died to us in order that we can be married without defilement to another totally different one it's 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 heteros in the Greek we know it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ who is the fulfillment of the law he's the one who God raised from the dead in verse 5 when we were in the flesh and and it's an imperfect imperfect in that in in that grammatical construction means formerly Formerly we were in the flesh. The motions of sin, which were by means of the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. We're going to see this contrasted with the fruit of the Spirit, or that which brings forth fruit unto God. That's the important consideration here that we need to take note of. We're also seeing justification and sanctification both in this chapter. Now, we will look more at that when we get to verse 9. What you need to do is carefully study this book, folks. I'm, I'm not here telling you what you ought to believe. I am not your guru. Uh, I'm not, you know, many of you I know consider me your pastor. But I'm not here to tell you that, that you're crazy in the things that you believe and that you ought to agree with me, even though it may seem that way at times when you t discuss things with me. That is not the purpose of these videos. I don't consider this ministry, this channel, to have any followers at all. You may be following this ministry, but you are not a follower of me. And this ministry is really not seeking a great following. It is the Holy Spirit, folks, who teaches us, and it, it is your responsibility to search the Scriptures carefully to see whether or not these things be so. One of my greatest fears is that I would lead people astray. I would rather die than teach error. Now, if I could jump ahead for just a moment, verse 9, verse 9. I was alive without the law once. Now, the purpose of these studies is to determine what God says. I have to take that at face value, folks. I was alive apart from the law once. My Bible says, I was alive without the law. It is an imperfect. It, it's a grammatical construction in the Greek where that you would translate it formerly. I was alive in past time. Where it says once, that's a Greek word for before or formerly. In past time, I was alive, separate from the law, 
formerly. Now, what does that mean? Many Bible teachers translate that, well, you know, I thought I was alive, uh, separate from the law. But that is a substitution that I can't make. You know, I assumed that I was alive apart from the law or without the law. Obviously, you know, says one commentator uh, that I read, uh, Paul was never without law. Hmm. Well, I was alive without law formerly. How can I say that? That verse is, is clearly wrong, that Paul was never without law, that he just thought he was. I don't think it's Paul. I think it's the, if you, if you know anything about this ministry, you know, I think it's the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is giving me what I consider to be very simple Greek to translate. In the past, I was absolutely alive, separate from the law. It doesn't say I thought I was, I assumed I was. I just was ignoring the law and, and, and going on. I, I was righteous in the way I kept the law. Doesn't Paul say later, doesn't he say later, that concerning the law, he, he was blameless? And of course, that's the reference that everyone turns to when they, when they come to this verse. Paul says, is touching the law. Now, you know, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And as touching the law, he was without blame. It doesn't say, it doesn't say, I thought I was without blame. Paul isn't even saying that he thought he was without blame. He was. What he's saying is that as far as he knew, he kept every aspect of the law. Every jot and tittle, the proper sacrifices were made, the, the proper approach to the priest was made. Why can't he say he was without blame? Why can't he do that? Any Israelite was without blame if, if he kept the precepts of the law in the Old Testament. Now we know, we know that he can't keep it all. Because if he's guilty in one point, then he's guilty of all. And he, he may not have loved the Lord as God with all his, all his heart. But as, as touching the services of the law, Paul considered himself blameless. But he didn't say he was alive. He doesn't say blameless here. I was alive. Now, if we go back up to verse 6, look back at verse 6. Now, we are delivered from the law. Now, are we or are we not? The word, folks, is katergeo. The law is annulled as far as we are concerned. That being dead wherein we were held, we serve in newness of life. Newness of life. Not in oldness of the letter. Newness of life. My Bible says that we should serve. You know, you really don't, but you ought to. That is, that, that is not what the text says. It's a present tense that we are serving in newness of the Spirit. You are. You folks out there are serving in newness of the Spirit. Whether you think you are or not, you are serving in newness of the Spirit. You're not serving in the oldness of the letter. You may try to do it. You may think you are, but in actual fact, from God's standpoint, from His standpoint, you are serving in the newness of the Spirit. What shall we say then? Verse 7, 
verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Of course not. May that never be. The law is not sin. On the other hand, I would never have known, says Paul, and the word is gnosko, I, I never would have intimately experienced sin, gnosko is experiential knowledge, except by the law. Let me illustrate. I had never known what it is to covet if the law had not said thou shalt not covet. And it is interesting that he picked on the tenth one, isn't it? Covet. I mean, folks, almost anybody can go through the first nine and, and at least figure out that they, they've gone through nine. I mean, you know, uh, I haven't committed any murder. Uh, I don't bear false witness. You know, and you can go down the list. You know, I don't lie and so on and so forth. And you get down to the last one and you got a problem. Thou shalt not covet. And we know, we know that without coveting, that there's no other breaking of the law. All the law is fulfilled in one word, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, if, if you love your neighbor as thyself, you don't covet anything that your neighbor has. One day last summer, uh, we were doing films, short films. Uh, myself and some friends of, of mine, we do this just about every summer. We were filming a short western, with, and if this friend of mine wanted me to see his new horse trailer, I, and I didn't even want to look at it because it's not right to covet. I had never known coveting. It's not a present tense, folks. It's an aorist. Unless the law had said, thou shalt absolutely not covet. Now, I've known some well-respected Bible teachers. I, I'm not going to mention names. Who have looked at that verse and they've said, just think of that verse. There's Paul. He, you know, there's the Apostle Paul. He thinks he's righteous before God. He goes to Damascus. You know, he sees a belly dancer, covets, bang, he sinned, he died. Again, he had to confess it. Now he's alive. He sees another. Uh, come on. Is that what you see in that text? Folks, it's, it's just simple grammar. These are not present tenses. I wouldn't have known coveting except the law had said, Thou shalt absolutely not covet. Therefore, sin taking occasion, and, and it's an aorist participle, an aorist participle precedes the action of the main verb. Sin taking occasion by means of that law or that commandment worked in me all manner of concupiscence, lustful coveting. For without law, sin dead, the text says, sin dead. That's what the text says. That's what the, the interlinear is showing me. You've got a couple of articles there. If you have the authorized version, they're not there. Separate from law, sin dead. That's what the text says. Sin is death. It took occasion by the commandment. Boy, if, if there hadn't been any commandment, there wouldn't have been any, any coveting. Without the law sin dead. Now we get to verse 9. 
I was alive. I was alive. It's an imperfect, separate from law, formerly. But when the commandment came, thou shalt not covet, sin revived, and I died. Those are aorists. It didn't revive over and over and over and over again. He didn't die over and over and over and over again. He died. I was alive without the law once. Now, now most Bible teachers say it just, well, that just can't be. He thought he was alive. He considered himself alive. He assumed that he was alive. You know, any substitution you want to put in there. And folks, I can't do that. I can't, I can't do that. I firmly believe the text says, I was alive, separate from the law, formerly. Now, now, so now the question, the question, folks, is when is this? When is this? This is where this gets interesting for me. For by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. So how could he be alive? How could he be alive? Who cares whether the law came or not? He's already dead. How can he possibly say that he was alive? Are you following this? Therefore, most Bible teachers say, well, he just assumed he was alive. That's If you pick up most commentaries, that's what they'll tell you. You know, he really wasn't. He just assumed he was alive. Now, maybe you can get me out of this quandary. You know, and, I, and I'd, I'd appreciate it if you could. If all men died in Adam, and that's what, that's what the Bible says, what does it take to go to hell? Adam. That's it. Adam. What difference does it make what I do? And yet we have text after text, text after text. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in Adam. Doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. You hath he quickened. The hath he quickened is a couple of verses before. And the translators have done right there. They, they've done a great job of that. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, are those Adam's trespasses and sins? Are those Adam's trespasses and sins? I don't think so. Fifth verse. Even when we were dead in sins, I don't think those are Adam's. Neither do I think that's the sin that all committed in Adam. Death passed upon all men for that all sinned. I, I don't think that this is that. Look at Colossians 2.13. Colossians 2.13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with Christ, having forgiven you all of those sins. How do I die in my sins if I'm already dead in Adam? Unless, unless, by some means, God has given me new life after the death in Adam. Are you following this? We're coming to the cross here. Look, listen, folks. I believe that the scriptures declare you died in Adam, and you were made alive in Christ. That's the first birth. You died in your own sins, not Adam's, your own sins, and you were made alive in Christ. That's the new birth, the second birth, what we call born again. 
you were born of the word and the first one and you were born of the spirit the second one if you didn't have the second birth you're in the second death that's where you don't want to be the first death was in Adam the second death was in your trespasses and sins your sins now I've always believed that if Christians could just if they could only understand this they would no longer have any doubt as to just who children who die wake up in the presence of Jesus Christ who removed their sin in Adam I have always believed that if Christians could only understand this they would never question whether or not God's demand for justice regarding sin was fully satisfied that he was appeased propitiation as it concerns the unsaved knowing that the unsaved will not be able to blame Adam for their being uh, condemned to the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment they can't blame Adam they can't say why are you sending me to hell because of something Adam did they died in their own sins folks no new birth no new birth and I've always believed that if Christians could only understand this they would understand that the law is actually the strength of sin in the believers life this is what the word says those are God's words not mine that they have become dead to the law by the body of Christ that that they should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead that's Jesus Christ that we should bring forth fruit unto God so we see sanctification there as well and when we study Jude we see we see that we have living people who are twice dead in Jude in Jude they're twice dead but they're clearly physically alive in fact they're fellowshipping with you I mean what does it mean to be twice dead and, and I've heard all kinds of silly silly comments let me tell you what it doesn't mean it doesn't mean well these guys this guy he over here he's he's really dead this guy he's not so dead he's half dead and this but this guy he's really really dead folks dead is dead and I don't think the 12th verse of Jude is saying boy these guys are so dead I mean they're really dead look you can't handle the text that way we're going to emphasize the fact that you guys are really dead these are people who died in Adam folks and then they died in their own sins they're not born again thus they're twice dead and birth is from above if there isn't a second birth then one is in the second death and the ultimate end of the second death is clearly revealed at the end at the very end of this book in the book of Revelation Folks, Paul is not assuming that he was alive. This is the Holy Spirit speaking. And the Holy Spirit says, he says, I'm going to use an illustration that, that you can't possibly miss. He was alive until he sinned. Then he died in trespasses and sins. You're not dead because you thought you were dead. You're dead in trespasses and sins. And what did God do? What did he do? He made you alive in Christ. He made you alive in Christ. That's being born from above. That's the second birth. Birth from above. You were born again by God's sovereign will. John 1.13. Not your own will. John 1.13. Even ministers get mad at me when I say, well, you know, if Paul died in a football accident when he was in high school, or if he had fallen off a camel, you know, and hit his head on a rock and died, he'd gone to heaven. 
Folks, he didn't move from heaven to hell on the Damascus Road. What he did is move from ignorance to light. But he was always God's. Chosen in him before the foundation of the world. He was alive. Then he died in trespasses and sins, and God made him alive in Christ. You and I put time on it. Some of you have heard me talk about, you know, the difference between time versus eternity, or that we, you know, we tend to, to and I, this is a whole totally other subject. It's where we, we want to make time an extension of eternity, and we can't do that. Because in eternity, time just simply does not exist. Just doesn't exist. It's the commandment came and I died. It's an aorist. Okay. You can't make a, a present out of that. He's not dying over and over and over again. Yet, yet many Christians believe that, you know, when you sin, you go to hell. I, I, one of the stupidest things I think I've ever heard as a believer is, is the idea that, you know, that you, you know, you're you're forgiven, you, you accepted Christ, you're forgiven. Now you sin, if you sin and you don't confess it, you're going to hell. And but but if you confess it, you're forgiven until you sin again, and then when you sin again, well now you're going to hell. And so it's back and forth, heaven to hell, heaven to hell, and heaven to hell. It's probably one of the dumbest things I've I've ever heard Christians talk about. You know, you confess the sin, you go to heaven, you sin again, you go to hell. And every time they tell me that, you know, I, I, I say, well, are you saying that I could be going to heaven on Monday, hell on Tuesday, heaven on Wednesday, and hell on Thursday? Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, that's, what, we're, that's what I'm saying. Who decides when I die? It has to be God. So if I die on Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, I'm going to, to go to heaven. But if I die on, on, a, on Tuesday and Thursday, well, I'm going to go to hell. But it's God who decides whether I go to heaven or hell anyway. And boy, people don't want to hear that. Because... Well, that's the doctrine of election, which they can't stand, but which is true, by the way. The commandment which was ordained to life I found to be to death, says Paul, but that's an aorist passive, was made death to me. Aorist passive. For sin taking occasion, we have it again. We had it in verse 8. We have it again. Sin taking occasion by means of the commandment, deceived me, and by means of it, I died. And once again, once again, it's an aorist. It isn't something that's going on and on and on. It happened once in God's eternal plan. It happened. I don't know when. God is telling me, folks, that I died in Adam. God is telling me that he removed Adam's transgression so that I was alive. And God is telling me that I died in my own sin. I can't put a date on it. I shouldn't even attempt to put a date on it. I, I mean, I want to say in my case that it was... It was, it was most likely when I was five, or or, or it might have even been in, you know, what they call the terrible twos. But, I, you know, I don't really believe that. I believe the text is clearly showing us all children go to heaven. That's a glorious truth in and of itself, that just that alone. The grand glory of grace is that is that me, dead in sin, not working for God, not seeking God, not doing anything good for God, in fact, being his enemy by his own words, when we were his enemy, Christ died for us. 
in God's sovereign plan. I was in Christ. I was in Christ, the one who's eternal. We now get into the section of the chapter where, where I, I do what I don't want to do and I don't do what I do want to do. And I believe that's where we'll pick up in our next study of this chapter. I would have loved to have done this video uh, outdoors. It's beautiful here in, in Northeast Oklahoma. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I thank you for all of your prayers, all of your messages of encouragement. These videos don't get a lot of views. I can publish a video on uh, prophecy and it might get a couple of thousand views. I publish these and it, it's, in the, it's in the hundreds. It just goes to show you just how many people are truly, sincerely hungry to grow in grace and knowledge of Him. I just want to know how much, I want you all to know how much I appreciate you. I really do. You give me uh, encouragement. Your letters give me encouragement. I need those. And so until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again. I just want to thank you again for the opportunity that you've given us just to, to take a look at your word and to meditate on it. I just ask that you would filter out all error, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.